our testimony. He's got a presentation for us he'll share. And um, as he's sharing again, just if you have questions when he's done, we'll have a time you can ask him questions. And at the end, um, and also I want to put in the chat, try to get maybe three people or so who are, are willing to pray for Eugene at the end of our time. So he'll share and then we'll have a Q&A time and then we'll have some questions and we'll just take an hour to do this time together. So let me just read his bio that he sent me. Not that he needs introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. Eugene uh, was born and raised in Silicon Valley, uh, NorCal, or NoCal, however, how do you guys say it? Is it NoCal? I think so. To Korean immigrant parents, he caught the bug for Japanese missions at the age of 14, which eventually led him to Biola University, where he graduated with a BA in intercultural studies. He is currently doing a master's of theology in applied theology at the University of Oxford in the UK, researching applied theology in the Japanese church while attending ECCJ in the London area. He loves to collect and uh, use fountain pens, nice, and other types of stationery, and can be caught talking about and looking up to good fountain pens and notebooks in his free time. And actually in Japan, they have some excellent stores for that. I don't know about in the UK, but um, we're very glad to have you, <clears throat> uh, Eugene. Let me open us in prayer, and uh, you can share your, your story. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time and just for your ability um, to laugh and just uh, hear this testimony. We thank you for Eugene's time, and, and Lord, we just pray that you would just bless his sharing and as he shares about how he came to know you, Father, and just his story and how you're working in his life and and what you're currently doing now and more details about that. Father, it's just so amazing that you give each one of us a story and you kind of knit it together like a big quilt, each one of us being one patch on that quilt and just an amazing time and energy you put into each one of us. So Father, as you've done so with Eugene now, we hear his story and we celebrate with him what you've done and the lessons he's learned. So Father, bless this time now and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Eugene, it's your show, buddy. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. It's just a bunch of pictures, so don't, like, don't get, it, you don't have to take notes or anything like that. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to quiz you after, I'm not going to quiz you after this. Um, but yeah, um, my name is Eugene. Um, as Matt said, currently I'm doing a MTH uh, in Applied Theology at the University of Oxford, um, focusing on Applied Theology in the Japanese Church. Um, my, my senior, my graduation dissertation is actually going to be on Japanese returning Christians um, and their faith walk as they continue to, as they're, as they're going back to Japan and how they deal with culture shock and all that. So, um, yeah, so good to actually come and give my testimony on the RJC track today. Um, this is actually my fourth EC. Um, my first EC was um, EC 2016 um, with the RJC track and Actually, Ariel was my small group leader, but I don't think he remembers. <laughs> really? Um, That's great. Either. I remember. That's why I said we were the first one. Ah, uh, oh, you do remember. Okay. Yeah, I let I let it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad you remember. And by the way, I, I don't want to make this like a super serious or like super like um formal formal thing i'm not a very good i'm not very good with formal so if you want to like jump in at a comment here or there or something like that i don't mind um cool. yeah um so usually the testimonies at rjc are more geared for japanese I mean, they're more japanese people who are coming giving their stories of salvation how they came to know christ in the u.s in the u.s or overseas or something like that um that's not um, that's not what I'm here to share. Um, um, my story is nothing like that. As Matt said, I was born to Korean immigrants, born and raised in the U.S. Um, so I'm sure a lot of my testimonies would actually be more similar to yours than to any of the people in the general tract. Um, but so what I want to do with this testimony is not focus specifically on how I got saved, although I will touch on that a little bit. But I want to focus on how God placed and grew the calling for Japan and for missions in Japan in my life. Um, and I hope, 
this is an encouragement to all of you, especially those of you who are still working out uh, what your calling might be, what, what you think God might be doing and what God wants you to do in, um, in terms of going to Japan or something like that. And so I've sort of divided this up into um, different, different sections of my life. Um, each one helpfully accompanied with a sort of plant metaphor. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, we're going to start with planting this, God planting the seed for Japan. Um, this is before I got the calling to go to Japan. And so my story starts in the Silicon Valley, uh, Nor NorCal, where I was born to Korean immig immigrant parents. And if you know Korean immigrants, a lot of them are, go to church and a lot of them are very, very heavily invested in the church and especially in the Korean church. And so I grew up going to church and I spent much of my childhood so, um, surrounded by their Christians. And this is sort of where I go into my testimony about my salvation. And growing up, I struggled that with having to meet the expect expectations of others, whether they meet my parents' expectations to get good grades, the expectations of those older than me to be a good Christian kid, um, or even just my peers' expectations just to not be socially awkward. Um, this combined with the hormones and questions of life that come with middle school and puberty and growing older um, led me to have depressive tendencies and thoughts of wanting to end my life, wanting to disappear, um, those kind of things. Um, while outwardly I was still trying to, part to put up a facade of being good, inter internally I knew I was dead inside. And this was in the seventh grade, um, so this continued on. This phase of my life sort of continued on for a year um, until in the eighth grade I attended my church's winter camp and there I properly came face to face with the love of God. One night at that camp the church invited the parents of the youth to come and read letters that they had written for the kids and so my mom came with a letter that both she and my dad had written for me and my brother and as she was reading this letter God softened my heart in order that so that I could receive his love through them. Um, I didn't accept Christ at that camp because of questions I still had. I was still questioning a lot of things and I was still dealing with sort of the depressive tendencies I had. Um, and I didn't feel ready to come to a decision about following Christ then. But I spent the next year looking for and eventually finding the answers to my questions in Jesus. And a year later, I decided to follow Jesus as his disciple at my church at the church, next year's church's camp and that marked the start of my new life so going back to the calling of how i was called to japan um but well, i'm going to rewind back to the end of middle school and the beginning of high school i was attending high school orientation and trying to decide which classes to take and because i didn't know what i wanted to do with my life yet i didn't know what career i wanted to go for i decided to go with the standards that they proposed for those aiming for a UC system education, which recommended at least three years of a foreign language. Um, my school offered Spanish, French, Mandarin, and Japanese. Spanish and French just didn't seem that interesting to me. And um, I took a year of Mandarin in middle school, but um, I hated every single moment of it. I did not have the patience for it. Um, wonder how I learned Japanese with that kind of attitude, but um, I decided that I did not want to take Mandarin ever again, um, and so I ended up taking Japanese. Little did I know that through that one single decision, got started my long tour, journey towards missions in Japan and towards the Japanese people. And so we go to the calling, um, if you guys recognize the date, March 11, 2011, that's when um, Japan had the um, Fukushima nuclear disaster, earthquake, and tsunami. Um, for me, this was sophomore year of high school. I was still in America. I was taking, I had been taking Japanese classes for about a year and a half. I still had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, which was distressing for me because everyone else around me seemed to have their life already figured out. Um, growing up in the Silicon Valley, you're surrounded by Apple, you're surrounded by Google, you're surrounded by Facebook, these big tech companies, and everybody's working towards becoming like a computer engineer, a software engineer, a robotics designer, something like that, in order to get into one of those companies and work, work for them, earn a stable living, and change the world somehow through that. 
And compared to these people, uh, I felt completely lost and didn't know what to do with my life. But that changed when March 11, 2011 hit. For me, uh, personally, the day started off like any normal day. I wake up, I go to school, I attend class. I had Japanese class in the afternoon, so I didn't know what was going on until I got to Japanese class. Um, but it was then when Japanese class started that my whole life turned around. When class started, my teacher announced what had happened in Japan and we ended up taking the day off from our usual grammar lessons in order to talk about what happened, look at some live footage of what was going on in Japan and just really grieve um, and just know what was going on in Japan. Um, as we were looking at news footage about what had happened, um, there was this one image that stuck out to me um, for some reason. In that image, I don't have the image on here right now. I couldn't find it. I've tried to find it for other testimonies, but yeah, it's there's so much footage that it's tricky to come by. But in the image, there was a bunch of people on top of a skyscraper with a helipad on it. And these people were just waiting, standing around waiting for someone to save them. And around them, the tsunami had already come in and, the, and it had already swept cars and it was dragging cars and part pieces of buildings across the, around the, around the um, skyscraper with the helipad. And you could tell that nobody was, no one was coming to save those people on the, was stuck on the rooftop. And even though I couldn't see their faces on the news cast, I could feel the hopelessness coming from them. I could feel the whole place is just coming from the screen. And I was, as I was looking at this image, God spoke to me in my heart so loudly that it almost felt like a real voice. And he said, do you see these people on this rooftop? They're gonna die without hope. They're gonna die surrounded in darkness. They're gonna die without, the future, without a future. I want you to go to these people, to give them hope, to give them light. And I was so shocked at what God was telling me then. Um, I was so shocked, in fact, that I, did, I didn't do anything with it for a couple of days. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, I was just so shocked that God would speak so clearly and so unforgettably. And I was just stuck in awe for quite a good while. But as I came to grips with what happened and what um, God had called me to do, um, I started to become like Moses in Ex uh, um, Exodus 3, trying to tell God to send somebody else and that I wasn't qualified enough to go to Japan to become a missionary. I didn't know about enough about the culture. I wasn't a good enough Christian. I didn't know the lang enough of the language to tell people about it, yada, yada, yada. And I just tried to fight against the calling. But God wouldn't let me off the hook so easy. And as, as he does, he, um, when he call, we say this a lot, when he calls people, he equips them to serve. Um, and the next couple of years in, uh, for the rest of my high school career, and from then on, a lot of it has been growing and pruning, this process of growing and pruning and growing and pruning this calling. So um, as I was in the middle of having these doubts, as I was in the middle of fighting with God of, don't send me, send somebody else. Um, God was gracious to me. Um, from the moment he gave me the command, he slowly started to equip me in order to fulfill the calling that he had for, my, for me. I started excelling in Japanese class by the grace of God and became one of the top students, which was interesting for me because I was always, I always considered myself a middle of the pack, never really excelled in anything kind of person. For, so for me to actually have something to be interested in, for me to actually do well in something was new for me. My teacher noticed this and invited me to take something, part in something called um, Japan Bowl. Uh, if you see here, this is high school, junior year me. Um, the quality of the picture is not so great because I just took it from Facebook and you know what Facebook does to pictures. But um, Japan Bowl, which was a quiz bowl for students coming um, high school students concerning Japanese language and culture, um, being able to quiz each other and I take quizzes and earn prizes. Um, I actually got to go to DC because of, because of this. Um, 
and go to the sac um, the Sakura Matsuri, the, the Sakura Fe Festival over there. Learning more about Japanese culture, learning more about the language. Um, and also because our school was the only school in the district with an ESL program. So many Japanese students whose parents were working in the US either um, just for a little bit or for, uh, permanently. Their, their kids, their kids, they ended up coming in into the ESL program in my school and studying studying English there. And because of that, I was able to get to get to know them a lot, um, get to talk to them, get to know them and through them I'm really learn more about the people and learn more about what, about what Japanese people are like. Um, in addition, because God, and God was also showing me that he could work through anybody and use anybody for missions that you don't need to be a super Christian to be missions. Um, because I grew up in the Korean church, I grew up surrounded by people who were amazingly strong in their faith. Um, I'm sure you've heard the stories of uh, people waking up at 4.30 in the morning, going into the, going, like, into the prayer, um, early morning prayer meetings every single day, praying for three or four hours, and then going into the, and going into the um, word and spending another two hours there. Um, basically lived at church because you know they were so devoted to God the super Christians and I grew up surrounded I, I and yeah because I was part of a Korean church I grew up knowing a lot of these people I grew up oh it's that it's that person's mom it's that person's dad um, and in comparison um, I had only become a disciple of Jesus barely a year and a half prior and I was still trying and failing to build regular rhythms of spiritual disciplines in my life, such as reading the Bible and praying. And I thought that if anyone was qualified to be a missionary, it would be the super Christians, the people who, who walked with Jesus 10, 20, 30 years, and who um, loved Jesus so much that they were willing to spend hours each day in prayer and hours each day in the Lord with him. But God, through my devotional times and through the encouragement of my mentors, showed me that this path towards Japan, this path toward missions in Japan was the path that he had planned for me and that I would walk in. I remember one devotional, um, just devotion time where um, I was just reading and I happened to come across Jeremiah 29, seven um, here, but seek the welfare shalom of the city where I sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. In its shalom, you will find your soul. And as I was reading this passage, I got the feeling that the Holy Spirit really wanted me to continue to pray for Japan and continue to pray for the welfare, welfare of Japan and for, and for to continue to bless Japan with, with my prayers and with my actions. And I mean, if we actually read the passage, it's terrible exegesis. Um, it's not a great, um, it's not a great interpretation of the passage. I mean, I'm not in exile. I wasn't in exile in Japan and, you know, it's not, it wasn't like that, but God was using, the Holy Spirit was using these kind of things and meeting me in these kind of places to show me that, yes, this is the place where I want you to go. This is, Japan is the place where I want you to go. And Japan is the place where I want you to spend the rest of your life doing missions. And in my talks with my pastors and my mentors during the time also, whenever I mentioned the fact that I wanted to do missions, the surprising thing for me was none of them turned me down and told me I was too immature or too much of a novice to do missions. None of them turned me down and um, told me to just come back when I was, come back when I was older, come back when I was more spiritually strong. Instead, they started encouraging me to take steps in that direction. They started encouraging me to um, really explore the calling for missions in my life, to really explore how I could be living the Great Commission. Even, even when I was in high school, even when I was um, not able to go to Japan and serve as a, in, any, in, any near in, in any near capacity. And so, I ended up taking um, several short-term trips to the um, Tenderloin in San Francisco at my church. This is me um, in freshman year, actually, um, as well as serving part of as 
part of the youth youth missions and outreach committee, uh, helping to raise awareness for missions in our youth group, um, and helping to lead prayer um, prayer movements for missions in our youth group. And so these experiences and these encouragements by my mentors and people around me really helped me to build a sense that this is missions is what I was called to do. Missions is what. I was, I was God, what, what God wanted to be to focus on full time. And when I eventually told my mentors that I eventually, that I wanted to go to college study missions, um, they encouraged my journey and pointed me into the right direction, which leads me, um, which led me going to uh, Biola University. Um, I say pruning the tree here, you'll see why. Um, for me, Biola University was one of the most nurturing and growing times in terms of not just missions, but also my faith in general. Um, but the road to get there was anything but simple. Um, as my senior year was wrapping up and I was starting to think about going to college, um, my dad, who was working in a small business at his time, started to have his business fall under because of various, various claims by other companies. Um, stuff like that. I don't know the exact details, but safe to say that um, he just had to shut down his, um, he just had to shut down his business. Um, and so questions have started to pop up about whether I would be able to afford college, whether I, whether I need to stay back or do community college for a year or two or something like that. Then on June 8th, 2014, um, what I never imagined happening, what ended up happening. Um, my dad ended up taking his own life um, due to issues with depression and being, and combined with sort of the Asian mentality of not being, the man has to provide for the family. The man loves his family by providing for the family. If he can't do that, he's nothing. Kind of those kind of thoughts mixed in with sort of depression that runs in my family, um, stuff like that, um, co coinciding with, the um, small business failing. And at that moment, it seems like I had lost everything. Um, my mom was a full-time housewife. She hadn't worked in a very long time. And yeah, we had savings, but um, it seemed better to be able to use them towards my family. Um, and yeah, I trusted in God and I, I wanted to trust in God and see, you know, God, I thought you were taking me this way, but it seemed, like nothing was working out, that nothing was going the way that I thought it was going to go. And uh, and eventually I would have to give up on this dream that God had given me and I would have to work at home going, without going to college, without going where God, I thought God was calling me and to help provide for my family. But even in that moment, God proved faithful in making a way. Um, my relatives from Korea on my mom's side had come up for the funeral and they really, really wanted to push me to go to college um, just so I could have a sense, of, even just so, I, if, just so I could have a sense of normalcy. And so they drove me and my mom all the way from NorCal to Biola, six hours, um, ended up talking to a financial officer who after hearing about the situation that I had, made sure that we got the right documents to be able to apply for a special hardship scholarships. And after all the scholarships, the amount that we had to pay was still a lot, but it was enough, small enough where my family could have to, could pay it without having to worry about finances, um, without it having to worry about it being a burden on my family. And so God provided a way for me to be able to go to Biola without having, without especially considering that I never actually went, took out student loans and never got into debt from Biola. And once I got into Biola, God used the three years that I had there. I ended up graduating in three years. Um, also, because if I took the extra fourth year, it would be too much, too expensive. <laughs> but um, God used the three years that I had there to really shape me and mold me into the person that I am today, the person who's passionate about missions for Japan. Um, from the professors, the lectures, to the friends that I made along the way, and the opportunities that I had to serve, um, God used my time at Biola to change me into somebody who loved Jesus and wanted to make his name great among the nations. And there's a lot of stories that I could tell about lessons that I've learned of people that I met along the way. So I'll just stick to a couple. 
Uh, one was during the one of the very first classes that I took. Um, it was a class called Foundations for Global Studies. It's an undergrad class, so Tommy and Tommy, I guess you won't be able to take it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it was a modified perspectives course. Um, and through it, I learned more about the Father's heart for the nation and his mission in bringing his kingdom to earth. And also more about um, my plan, uh, his, and sort of his grand plan and my role in it. As Matt was saying during the prayer, how we were, how we were knitted into, how we're knitted into a quilt, uh, quilt, I think it, it was that you said. Um, that right. we're, all, mm -hmm. we're all knitted into a quilt that pulls, that unfurls into the grand tapestry of what God is going to do. And as I learned more about what God's heart was for the nations, the Father's heart was for the nations and his mission in bringing his kingdom to earth. As I learned more about it, it motivated me to want to do it, to join his mission work. Like nothing else, after seeing what God's fatherly love for the nations, after seeing God's fatherly love for me and seeing God's love not ex extended, not just to me, but to every single person, how could I not want to join in? And also during my time at Biola, I started to, um, I helped um, specifically concerning Japanese missions. I, helped, um, I ended up helping start the Japanese ministry of, on Biola's campus, Hope Rising. Uh, when I, whenever I first came to Biola, it didn't have much um, dedicated towards gearing people toward mission in Japan. Although there was much in terms of other ethnic groups, um, I'm sure I, I haven't been to Biola in a while, so I'm not sure how many of those still exist. But um, <laughs> from the get-go, God was pushing me to start something for those with the same heart as me. And for me, it was scary because I was a freshman. I didn't know the college system. I didn't know what, what was going on. Um, I didn't know how to do anything basically on campus, but God was faithful in surrounding me with people who, who knew what they were doing, but, but who also pushed, we also ended up all pushing each other towards that goal of mission, of wanting to see Japan one for Christ. And yeah, because of, because of those people, because of all those people, we were able to do this, um, start this club, which has become a hub for prayer for Japan and by a lot of people who want to pray for Japan, people who want to really lift Japan up and see Japan one for Christ and learn more about Japanese culture so that they themselves can go. And through Hope Rising, I got to connect with other ministries such as APU Friday, um, I don't know if you've heard of Living Water um, in Pasadena, Gospel Salon, and through that, all the other, um, a lot of the other Jap uh, Japanese churches in LA as well. But by far the biggest thing for me in terms of my calling towards Japan was actually being able to go to Japan in the first half of 2016 as a part of a study abroad program. Because Biola is a sister school at Tokyo Christian University, I was able to do a semester abroad and through some connections that some faculty members had, I was able to get an internship with a church in Japan to serve there. Well, it wasn't my first time in Japan. I had been to Japan in high school uh, as part of a school trip, but being able to live there for an extended period of time, especially living with them, eating with them, talking with them, serving with them, praying with them, really seeing what their lives are like and walking with them in their walks with God. Actually being able to do that really allowed me to see firsthand what, was, what God was already doing in Japan, but also the need that God, the need that was still there, the need for people to go and go and spread the gospel in Japan. For me, um, specifically being able to go to a college for training future ministers of the Japanese church really allowed me to see the need for more Japanese young people to become leaders of the church setting the stage for my next stage forward. I'm sure we all hear the statistic, um, 70, I, the average age of Japanese pastors is uh, around 70. And yeah, going to TCU, going meeting these people made me want to do, do something about that. And so I ended up graduating um, 2017. This is my family. Um, I'm surprised it took this long to get a family picture in. Um, the person on my left is actually my mentor. His name is Bulu Scaldi, but he'll come up a little bit later. Um, actually, right now. 
which leads me to what, what's going on right now um, in my journey towards the University of Oxford. Um, truthfully, uh, going to Oxford was not something that I had planned going forward. Um, after going to Biola and TCU, I knew that my calling was to help encourage and equip and educate young Japanese people to become leaders in the church. And to do this effectively, I knew that I, have to, I would have to do a graduate degree in theology. But I thought that I would end up going to Talbot or Fuller or somewhere, somewhere along those lines. But my mentor at the time, um, Dr. Galadima, he suggested to go into an Ivy League school to do seminary as that would look better on a resume, open up more different possibilities to teach at a seminary, teach at a seminary. Uh, especially because I had already had the Bible college education and he figured that I was mature enough to sort of be able to be exposed to other types of theology. Um, but as I was looking at the I Ivy League co colleges, Harvard, Yale, um, Princeton, I got the sense that I, I wouldn't thrive there, that I wouldn't do well spiritually there. Um, and so I ended up just not doing I well I was still serving and stuff like that but I my my journey sort of took a stall for about a year and a half but I in the, uh, in 2018 I was invited to enter, attend another JCFN conference called WIT whatever it takes um, it's a very small conference designed for leaders um, or leaders of ministries or people who um, who are training to become leaders you can see Setsa in the, in the middle um, Christine, I don't know if she's there, um, but I'm sure, and yes. none of who did the testimony is on the front row. But um, when I was there, when I was at the at this conference, I actually got the opportunity to, to meet these two people, Pastor Aogu and Shisato Tateyama, um, who pastor ECCJ, the church that I go to now in, um, in London. <clears throat> As I'm after I met them and as the conference finished um, and I was going back home, I suddenly got the idea that uh, America isn't the only place that I could be looking for graduate school. And I immediately started looking up uh, graduate schools in the UK. And I ended up, the first college, I, the first university I ended up study, stumbling upon was the University of Oxford and their Masters of Theology and Applied Theology program. I thought, I and I thought it was a good program because uh, you get the, ability to research basically whatever you want in a very academically rigorous setting with basically oh, mountains where the Himalayas worth of um, resources at your disposal. Um, but because it's a, such a prestigious university, I didn't think I had any chance of getting in. Um, I thought there were many, many other, and I'm sure there are many, many other people who are smarter than me who could who could have easily taken my position at, at Oxford. But I decided that um, I was gonna apply and if God would allow me to go to, I would, would allow me to be accepted into Oxford, um, I would go. And although I sent in the application and I didn't believe, and I wasn't, I was sort of half doubting that God would fulfill on his end of the bargain. I. I ended up. It ended up. I ended up go, um, getting accepted to the university, and I ended up going there in October of 2019. And Oxford for me has mainly been a time of stretching, um, but of growth as well. Especially with COVID-19 changing everything about the way I study, I do work, I interact with others, go to church, et cetera, et cetera. It's been a hard year to say the least. Um, Oxford itself, with its academic rigor and various amount of and different ideas that I need to um, um, encounter and deal and really challenge. It's pushed me in terms of academic rigor and my theological thinking and the way I think about theology um, because Oxford pulls from so many different backgrounds, um, it's exposed me to new ideas and ways of thinking about theology that I hadn't encountered before and they challenge what I think, what I what I think I know about God, and ultimately allow me to better understand who God is, whether it's in new ideas that I hadn't considered before, or um, even in rejecting ideas that don't align, 
that don't necessarily align with traditional Christianity you, um, in, in the sense that you define yourself by what you are not. But in, also in the um, COVID-19, God has been really pulling away a lot of the support systems that I've had. Um, God has been really taking away a lot of the crutches that I've been leaning on for my faith. And he's been really exposing the places in my heart and the places in my, um, that I need to work on, that I need to really shape up. And honestly, a lot of those places, they got disguised because I was able to go to church that I was serving at church. I, did, I didn't think I had to deal with it because I was, I was a proper church goer. I, so I love Jesus. Uh, and I was serving at the church, but through COVID, taking all those things away, it's revealed my um, weakness and it's revealed the places where I need to grow. But God still has been faithful in the middle of this, that he's never allowed me to go farther than he can reach. Whenever I can, whenever I feel like I'm just at the bottom of my end, I, at my wit's end, that I feel like I can't go on any longer, God has always been faithful to pull me back up. And he's always been faithful to bring me back to him. Um, Pastor Kudora um, talked about the never the love of God that never gives up in the plenary session. I feel that every single day when I um, when I'm here at Oxford studying and when I'm um, just trying to live a life of faith in this, especially in this time. And so I trust that He's using my experiences here to shape me and mold me into the person that He wants me to be for His purposes, just as He has done so countless times before. And, and just to conclude, um, during my time at Biola, one of my professors said a quote that really lingered with me. And it's a quote that I'd like to end, end my testimony with. What will you do? What will you give up to fulfill the Great Commission? What do you have to lose? It's just your life. For me, as I slowly learned to give up my plans and my expectations to submit to his will, I found that he's been faithful in bringing me through the darkest parts of my life and allowed all of me to be used for his will. And in the end, what did I lose? Jesus says in Matthew 10, 39, he who finds his life will lose it, and he, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I lost my life for his glory and for his fame. And I find that I'm finding it back tenfold, a hundredfold, even a thousandfold of what I could imagine. Of course, I fall countless times in giving up my life, whether it's in the small things, in the everyday decisions where I choose to reject God, or even in the big things where, I, where I'm blatantly disobedient to him. But God is gracious and his love does not give up on me. And whenever I come back to him and give up my life once again, he comes and allows me to find it again forward than ever before. And as I, wrap, as I wrap up this testimony, I'd like to ask the same question to all of you. What will you give up in order to make his, to fulfill the Great Commission? What do you have to lose? What will you give up in order to make his name great in Japan and among the Japanese people? What do you have to lose? It's just your life. What is that compared to the glory of being able to participate in the fulfilling of his will and the bringing of his kingdom? What is that compared to knowing that you are participating in what you were called for, the original design that you were called for, the spreading of his glory and his fame across the entire earth? Once we take that first step of surrender to his will and his plan, he will shape us and mold us in order that he can use us to fulfill the Great Commission. Once we lose our lives, once we give it up for his sake, He'll be faithful in giving it back to us, often much more than we ever see. So come on, what do you have to lose? It's just your life. Let's pray. <sighs> Father God, uh, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love that never fails. Thank you that you've brought me through so many different trials, Lord, that as you've called me to give up my life, that you've given it back to me tenfold, a hundredfold, even a thousandfold. Thank you, Lord, that you have not abandoned me, Lord, but that you have continued to bless my life, that you've continued to really change me and mold me for your purposes. 
And Father, I pray for everyone here. Um, pray, Lord God, that Lord, that they would learn to give up their life, my God, for the sake of, for your glory and for your fame. Lord, you say that whoever lose, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I pray that you will help each and every single one of us lose our lives for your sake. Because we know that you will, because you promise, oh God, that you, that we will find it back. God, um, if there's anything that in my testimony that reverb, reverberated with people, like oh would you, um, would you continue to push it in their hearts, like oh God? And Father, when we see, like oh God, a new generation of workers, a new group of workers rise up, like oh God, people who are willing to live, give up their lives for Japan, people who are willing to lose their lives for your sake, in order that, in order that they might find it back even more bountiful than when you, than when they left it. Jesus, we love you. You are the center of everything that we do. You are the center of our lives. And Father, we live for your glory and for your fame. We love you and it's in your son's precious name that we pray, amen. Amen, Eugene. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Powerful stuff. Any questions? Um, take a little bit of time, maybe 10 minutes for questions. And then the last five minutes, let's pray for Eugene. So I'll try to get three people to pray for him. So open up to questions. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question to Eugene or feel free to comment. Roberta? Eugene, where are you now? I'm in, um, I'm still in Oxford right now. I graduate, um, I graduate in May. So June. you are wonderfully there in lockdown. Yes, I am wonderful still here in lockdown. <laughs> Take good care of Boris Johnson. <laughs> I don't, I don't deal with politics. I deal with, I know, politics. I know, but it's, you know. <laughs> But he's trying to protect you guys. So, uh, but how are you? A, you're not able to go around the city. So, are you're not. Are you able to go to ECCJ? Um, no, we've been we've been on. Um, so ECCJ has basically closed the church building, and we've been doing online services for the past from, since actually March of this year. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So. How did you get to the level of Japanese that you have now? Because I was in the prayer meeting with you last night. How did you, I mean, is it just been book study or you've been able to like be with people? Um, okay, it's a combination of a different, a couple of different things. Um, number one, I have to, I have to say that um, learning Japanese for me was, I, I would say it's a gift from God. Um, it's oh, yeah. something but I would say almost supernaturally allowed me to really excel in um, number two, just being with people. Um, after after um, I came, well, when I was in Japan, basically I put myself in a situation where I was basically dealing with um, Japanese people almost every single day um, that honestly, like I wasn't dealing with a lot of um, international I wasn't talking with a lot of international students I was talking more with um, Japanese students I was serving in a Japanese church um, I was really going I guess for me I was more about going out of my way to really immerse myself and immerse myself and really get to the place where I knew that I needed to be in a, if I wanted to when were you at TCU because I was I, I went to TCU as well um i went spring um so i was there um april to july of 2016. okay i know a lot of the staff that's why i asked mm -hmm. i'm not sure if a lot of them remember me but <laughs> oh they do i mean yuko mori would remember you i mean mm -hmm. kobashi sensei's wife would remember yeah. you mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. Because you probably had Kobashi Sensei when he was still alive, right? Yeah, we were. I think we were the last class when he was still alive. So, yeah. other comments, thoughts? 
So Eugene, as Mart May approaches and mm -hmm. you're going to finish, mm -hmm. um, what's kind of your most immediate next steps after that? My most immediate next steps um, right now. My I want to because with the Corona situation, it's thrown everything on its head. Um, originally, my plan was to go to Japan. I always I always try and go to Japan as soon as possible after um, maybe even get a job with um, maybe even start working there. And, um, and start doing ministry and get connected in that way. Um, but with Corona sort of, and with the shutting down of the borders again uh, for new visas, um, who, do, who knows? Um, right now I'm still, con I might, I'm considering maybe going to, going to SoCal, serving the gospel solo. Um, yeah, everything, uh, everything's still up in the air. Um, but honestly, like it's sort of, always been the way and it always been that way for big decisions in my life so i'm not like super worried <laughs> yeah i know there's some there's some mission groups that have specifically business as ministry Mm -hmm. parts of them. I don't I don't know which ones do because we don't have anybody currently with my mission that's business as ministry. We did, but um business as ministry takes a number of different forms and if you become a Japanese salary man, mm -hmm. that becomes a, a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. Um and it probably depends on what church you're connected with, how it's well it's gonna work. But I was thinking of course, COVID's uh, kind of skewed everything, you know. So, I was thinking more maybe um, going to going to, like working in a university or something like that. But yeah, if your Japanese is uh, N one, you can you can write your own ticket. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it you is can read and write in Japanese. You can do anything. I mean, it is N one. Is it barely N one, but still N one. <laughs> That's a big deal. Mine's up, mine's up there, but I can't, I don't take tests well. Hey, Gene, I put a, I put some pictures in the chat that I think might be the one you mentioned, but I'm not sure. Oh, if that's the helicopter the one support, yeah. That's the Minami Sanrico disaster office. Mm -hmm. Tommy Morrison, I met a student, her uncle worked there. And I'm not sure if that's um, the one you were looking for. It's, uh, okay, it's not opening for me yet. Um, okay. I, yeah. If you want to send it directly after, but yeah, there's a lot of footage, you know. Yeah, that might be the one because that's the one that's shown a lot. Mm -hmm. I just knew where it was, that's why. Mm -hmm. But I have to say to people that are here, Japanese language tests are not actually a measure of how well you can communicate and share the gospel <laughs> with people. Oh yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> because if if you think that if you pass this test, you can survive in Japan and communicate <clears throat> with people. And But tests are just tests. Um, because we had some younger missionaries that were so like in love with like, I passed this test, but they couldn't have a conversation with the vegetable stand lady. So so don't get don't get enamored with tests. You have to be able to talk to people, you know. Yeah, I sort of I sort of took the test as sort of like an aftermath after note. Um, just because I figured it was time to, oh yeah, time to get certification. But because being in a Japanese church actually is one of the best ways to learn some of the the spiritual vocabulary. So yeah, I will say I will say that N N one is un, it's unnecessarily unnecessarily hard <laughs> and two uh, was so vague I, I mean it had nothing related to real life yeah i will say that one is i mean it's because it's a lot of it's a lot of reading in terms of like reading almost academic level papers um 
And honestly, like if you're if you're living in Japan daily, like you're not going to read academic level papers every day. Um, you're going to be very reading editorials by you know by very uh, eloquent authors every single day. Most of your most of your day is especially if you're a missionary, just talking with people, just like really getting to know people, and that's something. And that's completely that's a completely different skill set. Problem. Completely different. The, the the JLPT is a different skill set than living life in Japan. Mm -hmm. That could be a whole other seminar. But it as we close be. out, does anybody have any last questions or comments for Brother Eugene? Again, um, I'll be, I mean, I'll be, I'm here for the rest of EC and then um, okay. if, um, my my name is the same here is the same as on Facebook. So if you want to um, send me a, send me a Facebook message, uh, send me, if you want to, I'll, I'll actually put my, I can actually put my line, um, yeah. line, ID, um, line ID in the chat. Um, if you if you want to ask me anything, it doesn't have to. Right now, but, um, if anything else you want to talk about, um, yeah, I'm more I'm more than happy to come. I'm more than happy to talk. I'm more than happy to answer any questions. You know, if it was before COVID times, I would ask you for a coffee, but unfortunately, can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, for now. Mm -hmm. Oh, the virtual coffee. <laughs> Do all of our networking now when we're all at home, and then when COVID ends, we can just travel all over the world and visit. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Good point, Ariel. <laughs> Good idea. Get the plans ready. <laughs> I'll let you know when there are cheap tickets to Japan. Four hundred dollars each oh, yeah. from California, mm -hmm. Seattle, Texas. Hey. It's still expensive right now. Right now is expensive, yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. like, why? <laughs> why? It's Japan. Uh, everyone's everyone's trying to get back in before the everyone's trying to get back in before the border closes again. So. Well, it already closed. Oh team. yeah. Is that you? That's him, yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, okay. can I have um, two people then volunteer to pray and end okay. our time? Ariel and one more. Can I have one more person join Ariel? Okay. All right, Ariel, you you start and Tommy, you finish. So all right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time to just hear testimonies of you working in life. So we see here that you have been protecting Eugene. Um, we we thank you for his vulnerability and just as he guided us through what you have been doing in his life, we see your hand ultimately there that you have kept him, you have protected him. We thank you that um, even in discouragement and depression, you have guided his path towards us. And we know that um, you who started good work in him would carry it on to completion. Uh, it's really cool to see how it all started from 2016, just hanging out with him, seeing that he's been growing in you and now he's taking more and more steps. We pray that uh, even during this time as we're all waiting to move and the borders have completely closed to Taurus, um, we're waiting for you to open the doors again, to send us all to Japan for mid and long term. We pray for uh, Eugene that as he's trying to figure out your calling for direction, um, may he know that in whatever direction he does, I pray that he does it for your glory, that he would uh, look at his skills, talents, and abilities and uh, given as an offering to you. We pray that you continue to keep equipping him before you finally send him. We pray that while he is in the UK, while he's in California, that he will mobilize and encourage others with his testimony and invite people to join him to Japan. When he leaves, he will be able to bring others from his communities, uh, bring people to pray for Japan, before, bring people to come and bring churches to partner with him. Lord, we pray for this time that... Um, that you protect him. We know that uh, they keep saying that UK has different strains and even in America, whatever is going on, you are sovereign and you have closed borders. You have slowed us down for a reason. So we pray that we will be uh, at peace waiting and waiting, knowing that you are good and that you would 
give us work to do. Thank you, Lord, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God, we thank you for our brother Eugene, and, and just uh, we praise you for the work that you uh, have done in his life and the work that you are, are doing. And, and Lord, that you're in your sovereignty, Lord, just, just working in him, Lord, showing your faithfulness to him oh, through so many things. And, and God, just remembering that, uh, that the work that you have been doing, that you will continue uh, on into the future, even though uh, it, it may not be certain where that might take him and what that will look like. Uh, Lord, I just pray that as he looks back at your faithfulness in his life, that he will uh, continue to trust and put his faith in you as he, he takes steps forward, wherever that goes, whatever that looks like. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would sustain him uh, as he finishes up his studies at Oxford. Thank you again for your provision there. And uh, yeah, we just pray that you would uh, just light the way for him. Ipo uh, Ipo, Lord, just step by step as he, as he follows in faith, uh, Lord, that you would continue your faithfulness to him. We just thank you for uh, just him sharing his testimony with us. We pray that that would just be another example for us, that Lord, to be encouraged, be reminded um, of your work and, and Lord, how you can do uh, that in our lives well as well. And, and Lord, we just thank you again for our brother and for this time. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Ariel and Tommy. And thank you, Eugene, really. What a blessed testimony and calling the Lord has placed on your life. I'm very encouraged. Thank you for having um, And I know God will use you in many more ways, including even now in this season that you're in. So very cool. All right, everybody. We'll have um, a little half hour break here. And then at three o'clock on the West and 6 p.m. here, if any are on the East Coast with me, we'll have another testimony time. Um, that will be a video to start. But then uh, my Mayuko, who's the testimony is about, will join us near the end of the call for like the last 20 minutes. And you can ask any questions to her based on the video we watch. And then we can also pray for her. We'll have two people pray for her. So feel free to go grab a bathroom break, stretch again, grab a lunch, food, snack, whatever. Or feel free. Are we going to stay in here, Tommy? Or we're in this one. We're going to close the room right now to force okay, you guys good. to take a break. Uh, and That's we'll be good. here a little bit before three, maybe 2.55. Okay. okay. Sounds good. See everybody in a little bit. Thanks, Eugene.